the the metaphor is in my opinion uh, extremely misguided because we are not talking about we shouldn't be talking about the divide and it's not just digital and so why is uh, divide a uh, uh, the uh, a wrong word um, there has been in the past uh, uh, 30 years uh, an, an accelerating rate of change that now uh, is, is, is impossible not to realize. Um, how many of you have one parent or the other, father or mother, that spent 20 years or more in the same employment? Basically all. How many of you expect to spend 20 years or more in the same employment? Okay. So, this is a very clear demonstration of how things change. Actually, I had a a wonderful moment yesterday uh, it is on that camera I haven't had the chance to put it up on, on YouTube yet uh, there is an Austrian artist uh, uh, called Johannes part of an extremely provocative but uh, genius uh, group called monochrome who was at the conference and uh, we were chatting on on, on video and uh, I told him oh no there was another guy and he told me oh you should meet him too and, and, and we spoke about what he did and what conference he spoke at because I, I wanted to hear what he said and I said oh at that conference there was a slide that I saw on, on, on Flickr um, how many of you know Flickr uh, the photo sharing site Flickr okay so uh, what do you use for do you put your photos online uh, some some okay Okay, uh, so uh, I saw um, a slide of this conference in Berlin called the Chaos Computer Club. Um, uh, which is a, a very interesting edgy, edgy conference. And, and this slide, I don't know whether we will find it, basically said, things change faster than we can die. And for me, it was it was astoundingly beautiful and frightening, uh, and uh, I didn't know who who created that slide. And it turns out it was that very person who was listening to us with Johannes as we were uh, shooting this uh, silly video. So I went and, and embraced him because it was just so wonderful. And so things actually <laughs> change faster than we can die, which is a pity, because. Uh, we are lazy. We are naturally lazy. Um, it, it is. It, there's nothing wrong about being lazy. It is in our biology. Um, and the fact that we cannot afford to be lazy is is, is a hurdle. Um, so there are people who don't overcome that hurdle, uh, like me, uh, and uh, become, for example, too fat, uh, or. Uh, there are other people who don't overcome that, uh, that hurdle and, and stay ignorant. Um, and especially in Europe, there is this perception that... Uh, how many of you are from Europe? All right. Especially in Europe, there is this perception that, uh, you, you, that society has to guarantee you uh, not only basic rights, uh, but has to guarantee you your, your, your well-being, your job, your, your salary, healthcare and these are great principles but not often practical um, and 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 you know the tension between the ideals and what is possible in a given moment in in, in society can be extremely extremely high extremely big big tensions that is why it is important to understand that as things change and keep changing and keep changing and keep changing uh, those who adopted certain tools, as the old metaphor would say, 
didn't just overcome one barrier after which they were fine. They didn't just say, oh, it's time that I go and buy a PC. They brought a PC home and they were part of what is called the Digerati, this global class of uh, international uh, internet orientated uh, uh, activists, uh, 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 creators and, and uh, shapers of the future. Not only because uh, it, it is actually uh, fun, but, but uh, uh, something that is full of effort, but also because having a PC is not enough. Having a PC is, is, is not, it means nothing. Um, I am, of course, nobody to say that uh, uh, Nicolas Negroponte, the founder of the MIT Media Lab, uh, uh, does anything wrong. Uh, I, I, I have no authority to, to criticize him. Um, have you guys heard of the one laptop per child uh, uh, initiative? Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, one laptop per child is uh, a, a very interesting uh, way of, of looking at, at things. Uh, um, basically, uh, the tenet is that, that computers are important. We have to give computers to everybody. Uh, the way computers are built and distributed today uh, cannot uh, reach uh, uh, countries like Africa, for example, or the Far East in, in uh, countries that are not rich enough to buy them. So uh, we have to invent a new way to build and distribute computers, give, it, give them to everybody, uh, and then everything will be fine. It looks like this idea is not working. Um, the computer that the one laptop per child initiative created is very interesting, very intriguing, especially to wealthy Western people who want to have it as their fourth or fifth computer. Uh, and, and I won't get into details of, of why it is actually not working, but having a computer means very, very little. And overcoming that hurdle of, of having had a computer, having acquired a computer, doesn't put you into that class who must feel safe and protected because now they are part of the future. It just doesn't happen that way. Because as I said, we are, we are, we are lazy. And we are lazy not only in our bodies, we are <coughs> lazy in our, in our minds as well. And that is also natural. So, um, Why are we lazy? Uh, we are lazy because we are very well adapted. Uh, laziness is actually a result of our, uh, uh, of our long evolutionary history. If we had so much spare energy in, in, in our bodies or in our minds that uh, we could do 10 times more physically or, or mentally as it is uh, represented in these urban myths. Oh, the human mind only uses 10% of its power, blah, blah, blah. If that were true, then somewhere in the past, there would have been an ancestor of ours that let us inherit genes that built wasteful bodies and wasteful minds. <coughs> there was never an environment so forgiving that a creature like that could have survived. Evolution is always very dangerous. And if you are wasteful, you die. So you don't transmit your characteristics if you are wasteful. You transmit your characteristics if you barely have enough. You can barely catch the deer, you can barely solve uh, the issue of surviving the winter in, with your body and with your mind. You can barely make it. And after, barely made, have, after you have barely made it, you have offspring who still barely make it. <clears throat> Except that in the past 10,000 years, we have built uh, with 
uh, what in, in, in the theory of capitalism uh, is called value added. We kept building, kept building, kept building various components of the world around us that afforded us incredible luxuries. None of us hunted to feed us or our children. None of us feared that the hunt would go wrong one, two, three days in a row and then we would die. None of us faced puzzles so difficult without being able and resort to any other means of overcoming the puzzle that would face an insurmountable obstacle and then we would die. And on average, even if we had plagues and wars and, and famine and uh, serfdom and uh, uh, all kinds of, of, of things that made our societies um, not always pleasant, on average, things have gotten incredibly better, not only today, but at any period of time we measure. Uh, there is a, a, a guy, uh, I don't remember if he's at Harvard or, 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 or Stanford, and I, I'm sorry, oh, let's look it up. Um, <laughs> a, his name is Pinker uh, mm -hmm. at MIT. Okay, um, Steven Pinker has a wonderful set of set of data that show that through any uh, period of time you measure it, uh, the violence in human society decreased, including World War II, including Rwanda, including everything as a percentage of the cause of death. In Neanderthal times, that some uh, ecologists would want us to potentially return to because it was so um, paradisiac, <coughs> people died of violent death 40-50% of, of the times. Uh, today is I don't know the statistics, but it's probably one in a million or something like that. Uh, and of course, we could look it up if we had uh, uh, more, more time. Um, so, we are now living in a society that our bodies and minds were not built for. Because the society doesn't require exertion from us, apparently, but this is not true either. Because if we do not overcome this inertia, then we delude ourselves. We delude ourselves because the guarantees that uh, we think are there are not truly there. The guarantees for well-being, for health care, for, for uh, a meaningful life uh, that are in many constitutions um, are ideals. But if society cannot sustain them, they would, will go away. Uh, 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 freedoms and opportunities and happiness are not natural laws. There is nothing in the solar system that says that people on Earth have to keep going like we do today. So uh, what we built in the 10,000 years past after we have invented agriculture and started in this curve of accruing uh, opportunities is kind of a tree towards the future that we can start pruning. And after we cut it all off, it will go away. And there is no reason for it to return for another few billion years. Um, so, we have to overcome this uh, very natural inertia and, and uh, we have to overcome it in our minds, in our bodies, working every day. So, what I 
propose is that instead of talking about uh, the digital divide as this single jump that we can overcome uh, with a single effort, uh, I would like it to be represented as side-by-side uh, -side people movers, walkways, you know, uh, at the airports. Uh, there is this wonderful book, Caves of Steel, by uh, Isaac Asimov. Um, and it, it is worth uh, reading. Uh, one incredible image uh, in that uh, book is uh, uh, this uh, urban transport system where uh, uh, pedestrians have a, a moving walkway that they can step on, which goes very slowly. And then there is another one, and they can step on that too, which goes a little bit faster, and so on and so on for tens and tens of walkways, until at the end, let's say, there is an express uh, um, uh, metro, a subway, um, and, and it has, um, uh, then you, you step on it because it goes 50, 60 miles an hour already after you went through side by side in the crowd actually in this fascinating system. This is the image that I, I have in mind because every change that occurs is apparently fairly little. How many of you use Skype? Yeah, because you talk to your friends and parents back at home, no international charges, Video? Skype video, anybody? So, a lot of people don't use Skype still. Um, they are an email. They uh, uh, read web pages. If you tell them, yeah, and what about blogs? Mm, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Um, they don't understand uh, how comments rank by relevance when you uh, look up um, something in, in Google block search, for example, uh, where there are the block searches and there you go, you can search by relevance or by date and relevance tells something. because they are not doing these further steps. They stepped on the people mover, they are going at a given speed, uh, they are happy because they look at the other people who are, uh, who are not even moving. But they don't realize that they can look to their right and there are other people who are moving at a much greater speed and that, that are, there are other steps to be made. And after they make them, there are still other steps to be made. What this also represents as an image I hope, is the differential speeds that you acquire. Because as you move, you will go at a faster speed, and actually when you look at your left, people are left behind. Because you are going at a faster speed. And, and it is, I, I, I haven't decided yet what, how, to, how to exactly interpret this consequence, but if you want to get off at a certain point, you have to actually calculate pretty well because you have to start moving to the left uh, uh, and not overshoot your, the stop that you want to get off. So uh, I don't know what this means in the, in the real world uh, with regards to the metaphor yet, but uh, we will see. So, What uh, I said regarding the original metaphor, the digital divide, uh, it is not a divide. And it is not even just digital. I mentioned to you that, that I think PCs are, are, are not an answer, uh, uh, or laptops. Uh, mobile phones, phones are even not an answer, even if uh, uh, just as mainframes 
don't matter in a scheme of things and the evolution of technology, uh, even if uh, only 30 years ago they were so uh, important that uh, the, um, there was a, a, an antitrust uh, inquiry to break IBM, the IBM corporation up uh, because of monopolistic practices and at the end, uh, uh, IBM voluntarily licensed the capacity of uh, building compatible mainframes to other companies like Amdal uh, in order to, 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 to stop the inquiry and not to be broken up. Um, it is interesting that the inquiry for anti-competitive practices that uh, is, is ongoing against Microsoft in Europe and has been ongoing until uh, some regime change in the US too, um, has not threatened concretely, there were some hints, but has not threatened, threatened concretely uh, Microsoft from, from, for, of, of being broken up because it didn't very much matter anymore. Because personal computers don't matter very much anymore. Because Microsoft Windows is, yes, the ultra-dominant operating system of PCs, but they don't matter anymore. Uh, what matters today is what are the interconnected devices, and now we call them mobile phones. We will have other names for them in the near future. Uh, but even that is not the point of how you participate in shaping the future because these are just tools. What matters are open minds and um, there is a somewhat uh, the meaning um, there is a somewhat That's our de reminder please turn off your cell phones <laughs> there is a somewhat demeaning um, way of, of uh, looking at people who love to experiment and to play with tools whether they are technological or whether they are toys proper or whether they are um, uh, new skills I want to learn to pay the piano or to hike or to scuba dive or whatever uh, and, and this is the meaning way of, 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 of saying that is when will you grow up you are just like a child uh, uh, and and, and it is a, a kind of a pitiful uh, reaction to this, this open mindset, which in my opinion is, is going to be an extremely valuable uh, characteristic, uh, probably uh, a characteristic that, that, that nobody should be without in, in the future, maybe already today. Just as a little child will explore with curiosity everything that you throw at them it is whether it is a song whether it is uh, a new environment whether it is uh, a, a new object uh, uh, when they are very small and and they taste everything they try and, and bite everything that is um exactly about their their open minds and 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 we are uh, conserving more and more of this attitude on one hand, because our society, as I described before, shields us somewhat from extreme consequences of our, of our being trustful and open. Uh, a lot of things that, that you couldn't do in nature, uh, you can fairly safely go and, and do in, uh, uh, in, in, in our environment. You, know? you cannot go in a jungle and say, oh, wow, a cool plant, let me taste it. Uh, it would be foolish, but you can go most of the time in a supermarket and say oh I have never had that let me try and and the most that you can happen is, is that you don't like it and so this type of 
of, of curiosity and open-mindedness is crucial because with the rate of change that we are experiencing today, things change fast and we can die. Things change fast so quickly that I don't see any here, but any office you go, probably you can find a book entitled um, the Windows 95 Bible. <laughs> 500 or more pages long or the Microsoft Office uh, uh, 2003 from A to Z or whatever else. And of course, there are people whose job is to know everything about a given tool or a given set of tools. Um, and then they go, they must go very deep in that. But for many of us, a tool is, is just a tool and <laughs> exactly because they change so fast, so fast that if they don't change fast according to our expectations, we, we ridicule them. We say, uh, huh, look, Microsoft still didn't come out with a new version of Office. They, this expectation is so ridiculous now that uh, uh, software companies started to call their products with a version number corresponding to year that hasn't come yet in order to keep up with the expectations. The branding of Office, the new version, Microsoft Office 2008, started last year. Like uh, cars. Yeah, I, I don't know that example. Can you tell me? No, no, like cars. Uh, are cars? Advanced, yeah. uh, are they? Okay, yeah. sorry, I, I'm, I'm less of a car person. Um, so, what does that mean to us? It means that instead of going deep, we should go wide. <coughs> when, when, people, uh, when people go in a, in a different uh, uh, vacation spot, or when they uh, want to learn tap dancing, or when they uh, take a few months off to care for the elderly, when they... Uh, um, seek uh, out advice for their um, saving strategies or whatever new stuff they want to learn. It is not only because of curiosity, but because of a type of adaptation to the way the world works today uh, that is extremely, extremely useful. And what is uh, the, the, the consequence of, of that? Well, uh, when you go deep, you can be perfect. Uh, you can learn everything about MS-DOS. Who knows what MS-DOS is? Oh, too many. I have to find enough. Who knows what CPM is? Okay, good. We reached the threshold of the other way around. <laughs> so, um, uh, MS-DOS is what preceded Windows. It's a, is a, a, a common line interface to the computer. Um, CPM is what preceded MS-DOS. It was another command line. And there are probably still people who know everything about every command in that uh, operating system and the various parameters, but their knowledge is not very useful anymore. They will never make any mistake. They will work perfectly in that environment and nobody cares about them not making any mistake. Their perfection is totally useless. Um, on the other hand, we uh, are here now with a series of tools uh, transmitting in real time, uh, recording, uh, etc. And we have a problem. The chat room that would allow our listeners to make notes in public about what I'm saying and potentially ask questions. I could, at the end of my lecture, say, let's hear your questions and let's hear their lectures, uh, questions. Cannot, because the software is misbehaving. It's not connecting to the chat room. In, case, in this case, this is the fault of the, of the system, which is in, in beta. So it's not in a final version yet. 
Um, and for example, this uh, welcome to CSIM is our fault because we didn't know how to change it, even if that is a, 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 those three words were put up by us, but what we can't find it, so who cares? <laughs> and that's the point, who cares? We will move on. These mistakes are absolutely tolerable because if we wouldn't tolerate them, we wouldn't use the tool, and not using the tool would have a downside which is much higher uh, than not uh, you or anybody else uh, seeing these mistakes and, and, and whatnot. Um, so, wide first and eventually deep, or, or, or not even, as long as this openness <laughs> remains. So, um, mistakes, errors, differences, differences that are not only in uh, what you do, of course, in, in, in a professional environment, mistakes and differences in communication, in behavior with other people too, other people of, of other uh, groups, other languages, other ethnicities, other religions. This is what we call tolerance. So, we have actually come to the end of this half of our conversation from talking about the rate of change in society and how to interpret that rate of change, how to make sure that we can uh, adapt to it what can we learn? How can we picture this and our adaptation? And we have come concluding that if we can, we will become a more tolerant society, better adapted individuals, more capable of coping with what is going to come. Because the rate of change hasn't stopped. The tools, keep coming. Um, Twitter is the latest generation, for example. Uh, when somebody writes a web page, maybe they update it every six months, every year. When one, somebody writes a blog, they update it every month, every week, maybe once a day if they are really passionate about it. If somebody is on Twitter, they update it ten times a day. And Open Spine the company I co-founded is about updating data streams many times any second with tens of billions of devices in the world. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much. Did I make sense? Yeah, sure. <laughs> That's good. Um, questions? Who, who's going to be the icebreaker? Oh, I didn't tell our story. I will tell our story. I, let me tell you. Uh, so the first question, you can, me ask, can you ask me, can you tell the story of Mark and you? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great question. Um, a Mark, who is uh, a, a student at CSIM, uh, and I uh, have 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 never met. Uh, uh, actually, this is the second time we meet in person. Uh, the time before. We have, we have never met. Uh, and what happened is that uh, I, uh, I was going to, I was going to uh, the Web 2.0 um, conference in Berlin, and 
he was going there too and uh, there was this uh, social network called Crowdwine that enabled participants uh, to the conference connect to each other even before the conference started correct me if I'm, I'm, I'm uh, making some mistake because I'm, I'm not sure of the sequence of events and uh, uh, another series of, of, of uh, speeches I have concern second life and, and what is the meaning of the metaverse and why second life uh, is just an example uh, whether you like it or not but uh, persistent 3D online worlds are bound to be an important part of our future blah 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 and, and uh, we were both experimenting with uh, a, a, another tool called Seismic So, since Mark was not sure about the value of Second Life, he asked a, a video question uh, on Seismic, which is a, a video sharing site where you converse. You don't uh, put up a music video or... Uh, a clip of, of any kind, you converse on video in the, in the internet. So he put up a question asking, why, why does, it, why does uh, uh, Second Life matter? So uh, I uh, responded to him on video. And um, I was uh, on, on, the, on the terrace of my, my home and uh, there you go. Mm -hmm. This is this is it. So I was I was on the terrace of my home and held up that camera in in front of me like this. Uh, it was evening. The light was nice. And and and, and I and I said, Hey, Mark. Uh, I think this is what Second Life is for. And I recorded a two-minute video that I posted in Seismic. Then I posted it on YouTube or the other way around. And so. Um, he, there came his, his <coughs> second question. He said, oh, no, 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 I don't believe you or, or I don't understand what you said. And, and he was uh, at the airport already. Uh, and in Berlin or in? No, uh, flying out of the yeah. US. Oh, out of the US. And so my, my second answer uh, was uh, recorded <coughs> Uh, in Berlin because I, w I was already there and I was saying hey Mark uh, thanks for your second question I was walking around with the notebook like this uh, in the hall uh, of the conference showing him hey I, 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 I hope you arrive soon because this is cool um, and and thanks for your further question and gave him some further answers blah 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 and, and then I left the conference I left Berlin and he arrived and I wasn't even there <laughs> So you never met in Berlin. We never met in Berlin. <laughs> um, and, and then what happens is that, um, this is another crucial point, but we don't have the time to go into too much detail about it, uh, how you manage your online identities. Uh, a, a lot of people um, fragment their identities, and that is fine as soon as they don't lose track of them. Other people, like me, use the same nickname everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I'm easy to, to, to track down. Uh, uh, on every service I, I register, uh, I use uh, David Orban, and, and there are other, not a lot, but there are other David Orbans in the world, and I'm sorry because I'm, 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 I'm staking claim to this nickname, and unfortunately they will haven't choose another mm -hmm. one. Uh, and, and, and since I am, I'm very much into this, it never happened that they would have registered first uh, on, on any kind of service than me. But uh, we found each other, for example, on Twitter, and we started to, to exchange uh, what, are, what are called tweets, which are, once again, these uh, little things. What are you doing? I'm having a lecture at this university or at this conference. Uh, oh, that's great. Um, you know, I'm this cool. Oh, no, no, it's, you know, it's great. I'm going to class, says Mark. These are not necessarily answers. They are ideas that float 
But ideas also cross-fertilize, they, they meet, they join, they uh, intersect. So, uh, Marx said at a point, um, no, it's so complicated that I lose track of it, sorry. But uh, I was in San Diego another time, and I had to uh, actually um, um, lecture uh, in Italy while here in Second Life. Uh, and of course, it wasn't a problem because Second Life is everywhere, so it doesn't matter where you are. And, uh, and, and, and so Mark said, oh, this is so cool. Do you mind if I come and see while you are doing it? I said, no, come over to my hotel room, which is actually fantastic because the bandwidth in my hotel room was not enough. So we took up in his car and went to his home. And so I did the whole thing from his home where he, he took a video and he posted online the video while I was doing all this. So after this, uh, this funny and crazy series of things, which amazingly went pretty well without any major uh, hiccup, he said, I'd love to, to, to show this uh, to, to, my, to my school. So um, in, in, in September, we missed each other in Berlin, having never met before. Uh, in uh, January, maybe, I was here to give the uh, the, 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 the conference speech in Italy through Second Life in his home in February no that's that's gonna be no December in in in, in February I had in January sorry I had a, a lecture here uh, talking about uh, how brands uh, change uh, in in uh, in um, how, how brands need to evolve and and that was via remote presence. Uh, there were two projectors. One of them had me uh, in, in Skype video, my, my face, and the other had me, had my slides and, and maybe Second Life. So that was cool too. Yep. And, and so I'm here in person now. This is the third uh, variant <laughs> of, of my, my interactions with, with Mark. So this was a story that I wanted to tell you because it is it's very interesting, very interesting, and maybe not common, but uh, of how things can be very, very flexibly arranged and how many possibilities can be born as, you, as long as you are ready to, to, to have fun, because it is actually just all adventures and very interesting, very stimulating. So, thanks for the first question. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Dr. Makula. Um. In terms of the virtual world, yeah, um, what do you see would be the next step beyond Second Life? Um, one of the most important things to realize is that we are really at the beginning of understanding their meaning. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, the, there are many online worlds, we mentioned a few, mm -hmm. uh, World of Warcraft, uh, uh, Counter-Strike, uh, there are other ones who are uh, very much uh, enterprise oriented. Uh, a, a great example of this is for Terra, mm -hmm. uh, which costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to license and millions of dollars to deploy. Mm -hmm. And uh, consulting companies like Accenture love that. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, the tool truly corresponds to some needs of these corporations like uh, um, control, security, mm -hmm. uh, configurability, um, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, just like some of you, but certainly you, remember there was a time when email systems couldn't talk to each other, and if you were on CompuServe, you couldn't send an email to somebody else who had a .edu address, and only after quite a while there were gateways that clumsily established the communication, but still if you sent an attachment, 90% of the time it would come out of the other end totally garbled. <laughs> yes. The next crucial step will be interoperability. And the consequence of interoperability in online worlds is going to be actually quite astounding. Uh, how many of you buy songs on iTunes? Okay. Um, how many of you have an iPod? Okay. DRM sucks. 
<laughs> and companies pretending that after you bought a song in a given or any media, mm -hmm. films or whatever else, uh, that you bought uh, a, a digital um, content, a film, a song, or what else, you should pay for it again because you are listening to it on another device or watching it in a different format are hiding behind the law but what they are doing is shaping society to guarantee the survival of their failed business models <laughs> and dangerously curbing civil liberties and forcing universities to spy on their students behavior in order for their lawyers to be able to bill for <laughs> 400 500 dollars an hour uh, 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 funding fake scientific reports that would suggest untrue consumer behavior and, and planting uh, false statistical evidence on the impact of what they call piracy. And this is all uh, wasted effort, obviously, because you cannot stop things change, it is, a, it is a fluid that goes in directions that no corporation will be able to stop. America is not going to become a fascist society just because uh, some, some music company wants uh, people to keep paying for their music. Okay. I am not a holder of solutions, but DRN, the Digital Rights Management, which many people call Digital Restrictions Management, the fact that when you buy a song on iTunes, you are treated worse than when you transfer a song from your CD, or that when you uh, purchase a DVD, it is a medium that has been crafted already to make it difficult <coughs> and the law has been then devised to make it illegal to do what you should be able to do with the film that you just bought. Um, so this, this cannot work. DRM cannot be the solution. So what does this have to do with, with online worlds? A lot. Because today, one of the most popular online worlds is, is, is Second Life. And there, there is a chain of trust. There is a DRM system which works fairly well, where I can uh, design a digital good like a bottle of water that somebody likes. And if I want, I can sell it. And it can have the property of being non-copyable, non-transferable, or non-modifiable. Uh, physical goods have some of these properties. Mm -hmm. If I give this bottle to Mark, I won't have it anymore. But digital goods typically don't have this property. If I give a song to Mark, I will still have the song. Um, and, and there can be no law that will make me forget the tune. You know, If I read a book mm -hmm. and I have the idea and I give the book to Mark, I will still have the idea. This is the true nature of digital goods. Mm -hmm. So, forcing, as Linden Lab have chosen to do, digital restrictions to digital goods can be interesting in the short term. And there have been digital artists who have flourished in Second Life because, for example, they design fantastically cool dresses. And there are people who go and buy those dresses to dress up their avatars because they want the avatars to look cool too. But it cannot hold in an interoperable connected series of online worlds because when the good leaves my system and enters your system, then you receive the stream of data and it says, basically, to simplify, it says, hold on, an object is coming. One moment, this is the lock. Lock over, this is the object, transmission ended. And you can, not necessarily, but you can say, lock, and throw it away, mm -hmm. and still keep the object. Mm -hmm. 
And digital restrictions is a very strange fence against what is called intellectual property theft, which is a misnomer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, digital restrictions are like a fence which is two mile high and one feet wide. It's enough that one person in millions of servers disrespects the lock and discards it and releases the digital object without, and it's over. It's over. So it is very interesting that uh, Amazon now sells songs without DRM, that Apple sells songs without DRM, that Tor, uh, one of the biggest uh, publisher of science fiction books, releases uh, uh, electronic versions totally unrestricted of books simultaneously with their print date and availability in bookstores. Um, and what will happen in online worlds is that it will teach us exactly the same regarding physical goods. Because what is the next 10 years going to be about is open source hardware, about 3D printers, that just as laser printers were used in the past 20 years to reproduce ideas in an unfettered manner. And one of the reasons why uh, uh, communist societies have been unable to shell shield their citizens from the influx of ideas from abroad is because they could not control photocopiers. <laughs> and, and, and they could be the most repressive regime, but still ideas couldn't be stopped. In the next 10 years, a new category of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, object that produces other objects is going to be uh, ubiquitous. And this is the, the 3D printer, which will download and create physical objects. And the teaching of the in interoperability of online worlds to us will be that we shouldn't even try and make these into a DRM system because it cannot work. It will be wasted effort, so we shouldn't even try. We just go in another way. Um, and, and the fundamental book about what this is, what, what will be the consequences of this, because you asked me what I propose, so, so let, let, let me not propose anything, but uh, go out and buy the latest uh, uh, issue of Wired magazine, which has free on its cover and excerpts from the forthcoming book by um, by Chris Anderson uh, who is the editor-in-chief of Wired and the publisher of the long tail who read the long or who have heard of the long tail as a book okay um, check it out not don't read necessarily the book but read the article that you can find online and then read the article free as well so so that is, that is uh, I think, part of the future, this uh, concept of, uh, of how can you make money by everything being still free.